Right. I think we can start. Uh, welcome everyone this week. Uh, we have a pleasure to welcome Philip at, at our seminar. You might have seen him uh, a few times, but now we uh, get uh, uh, now now we get to get the best of and uh, the most of him is presenting. Um, but he's in Corvinus, so um, it's a great opportunity um, for everyone to establish first, second, or first contact. Um, so please. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, thanks a lot for not playing with my bad work. I might be. I'm not sure. Let's see. Um, and thanks a lot for coming. I mean, I know it's a super stressful time for everyone right now, so I appreciate it even more. <laughs> All right, so one thing to say is this is very much worth in progress. So I'm happy to take any type of comments, right? If you say, okay, this, this doesn't make any sense, please tell me. I mean, I might discard it entirely, very likely will, but sometimes I'm listening. So there's a chance. Or if you have questions about certain things, please do so. The second thing is, Obviously, I can't go into detail for, for every single step of the way. So please interrupt me right now, right? Don't wait with the questions until the very end. Just if you have a question at some point, interrupt me right away. Don't, don't bother waiting or waiting until I finish my sentence because sometimes I don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, just jump in right away. And usually it's I'm giving you a rough idea what I'm doing in a certain area. But if no one has questions or comments or wants to see more, I'm going to the next one. But if you want to see more, I'm happy to dig deeper into it. All right, that's the disclaimer. Um, so this is about purified randomness. And this is, again, very much work in progress title. I mean, I think it changes every time I'm looking at this. And it depends who is presenting it. I'm not even sure it's the same title that you should have it was so probably not right. I think it is. It is. Okay, it's a joint work with Wilan Müller from Vienna and Tilburg, and um, Alex uh, Wagner from the Union of Salzburg. And as you can see, it's about game theory, and we tested part of that in the lab. So the left in this case will be yeah. All right. So um, first of all, uh, given that I actually don't know a couple of you people, I mean, who of you guys is working roughly on game theory or with game theory? Okay, that's that's fewer than very good. So I need to explain to you a little bit. Um, why, I mean, why should we even care about these weird mixed snatch equilibrium, right? Um, <clears throat> obviously, I'm not giving you the, the whole story. I, I tried that with my students this term, it only worked like with 50%. So, all right. So, I mean, I guess you all have heard of Nash equilibrium. Uh, we are that, not gonna cover that. Um, but mixed Nash equilibrium. Obviously, we right, we are not playing few strategies, so either A or B, but something in between. Um, the problem with that is if you're looking at the, the very, very simple mixed Nash equilibrium, also the complicated one, but even the sim simple ones, is that you're mixing in a way to set the other person different. Right? If both people are mixing, then I'm deciding my mix, mixing probabilities in a way that the other person is into. That has some really weird effects, like if I'm changing only my payoff in like match tennis game or something like this, I shouldn't change my, my if there's one global mixed equilibrium, uh, equilibrium, I shouldn't change my mixing probability there if I think we're in a mixed natural equilibrium, but the other person should, whose payoff I haven't changed. So it's kind of weird. And everyone who tried to explain that to students um, or had trouble learning that themselves, I mean, maybe, I mean, I did, but no, it's a very difficult concept. And it's very difficult to convince people that this actually works or that this is actually the right way to do it. So um, here, this is the thing 
the players in different between strategies that are played with positive probabilities. So everything I I'm mixing between, I really don't care, right? I mean, I, I could choose one or the other thing. I'm only mixing that the other person is also indifferent. Makes sense if you're thinking of situations like, oh, I'm playing poker against someone, then I'm trying to hide, right? That's one interpretation of mixed strategies. I'm hiding what I'm having here. I'm hiding what I'm doing. I don't want the other person to learn anything. But we also have mixed national figure in coordination games, games like hot dog games. We all have these kind of things, right? Where actually our goal is to coordinate, but there's still a mixed, uh, yeah, uh, national human mixed strategies. All right, so why should a player bother selecting precisely the mixed strategy probability that induces the opponent to be different as required for the group? So it's not widely equilibrium like that, but I mean, if we already all assume that we're in the equilibrium, we shouldn't care anymore. So why are we still sticking that? Um, and one interpretation of that is that, um, in the words of Azami, that by the way, apologies, I know I'm writing the name. Incorrectly in Hungarian. Um, yes, but I, I stole most of the slides from Milan, and we usually don't write it correctly. Um, all right, so what he says is in the face of if you win points in mixed strategies, they're unstable because any player can deviate without penalty from its equilibrium strategy, even if all other players stick to theirs. You can shift to any field strategy. So that's just what I said, right? I mean, in the end, he doesn't care if you place A or B or some mixture because you should be different anyway. And this seems to pose a serious problem because many games have only mixed regular national hero points. All right. Obviously, we wouldn't be here if you only said, okay, that's a problem, we're stopping here. Um, so he gave um, what I would call an interpretation of way we can think of mixed strategy genetic area. What I would like to add is with humans, right? I mean, I know genetic are used in, in a lot of different things, but especially when we're, we're talking about humans, this works pretty well. That's good. Oh no, it looked like you had a question. Sorry. So a mixed strategy genetic room or normal form game with complete information can almost always, I mean, I'm not a theorist, I'm not going into the details here, and most of you know that anyway, can be interpreted as a pure strategy based in national premium of a nearby game with a little bit of incomplete information. Okay, that's fairly vague, but I'm experimentalist, so that's fine. Um, the idea is what's a nearby game with a little bit of incomplete information. This just means that, I mean, you can have a lot of information for that, but there's something that's not modeled, right? There's something like, okay, maybe I like one color a little bit better, or I, I rather go left than right, or things like that, right? Something which is not in the model, but there is some slight perturbance in these pairs. So if we're writing the game down like, oh yeah, if you're choosing A and the other one choosing B, then you're getting two. And the other way around, if I'm choosing B and the other one is choosing A, then I'm getting one. In reality, it could be, I'm getting one plus a little bit of epsilon because I like the letter B slightly better than the letter A. Right? It can be a tiny thing, but that's enough. So, um, <clears throat> that means all of a sudden we have pure strategy based in Nash equilibrium, right? No mixing anymore, just by adding this little bit of noise. So, one question is, which you usually get when you have more experimental folks here, um, then, oh yeah, we have seen a lot of experiments on game theory and except in very very few cases they never managed to play the national group 
So why do we even care? Um, for, for this paper, this is actually one of the points I'm trying to make. If we are removing all of these little incomplete information, right? Because that's what we're trying to do in the lab. Try to make everything as sterile as possible because we want to exclude everything like taste for color, taste for letters, or if I'd rather go left or right. We want to remove that when we're not. But it might make it harder to actually play a mixed measure group because instead of right, because playing something which is like a pure strategy based in that equilibrium, we actually have to mix. Right? Mix means we have to generate a random number in our head between things where we don't really care about that much. Which gives us another problem. It has been shown over and over again that humans are really, really bad at randomizing. Um, so if you're asking them to generate random numbers or a sequence of random, general num uh, random numbers or choose one random thing from a couple of them, people just can't do it. I mean, I'm just writing here Marina Halak at all because there are a lot of papers. Some of them are by her. There's an entire literature. But she has a couple of very nice ones in nature, science, and these kind of things. So, and they have shown, okay, very, very few people are able to randomize at all. <clears throat> all right. One thing which will come up later, if people have experience that they are getting rich. Right? If you're having poker players, very, very good poker players, they are much better than the normal individual. If you're looking at really good professional tennis players, really good goalkeepers, these kind of things. There's literature that shows, okay, with the goalkeepers, they are able to play the mixed natural trivia. With the other ones, they are better at randomizing. Still not really great, but much better. All right, but I mean, the normal person, like you and I, I guess, we're not even if we learn. All right. So, this was everything I wanted to give you for motivation. If you have questions about this, or tell me no, maybe this is not it. Interrupt me now. No, very good. All right, let me give you an example. Um, and when I'm talking about an example, you can take this. So, let me just show you briefly how um, purification works. So, you, you see this game here with 300, 200, and you can see this is an asymmetric matching penny game. So how does it work? We have two players, they are both choosing heads or tails. And if both are choosing the same thing, right here, then player one wins. Here he wins 300, whatever 300 is here. And here he wins 200. And player two, she wins if they are choosing something different, right? So it's it's here, getting 300, chairs at one. Okay. This is already very similar to what we did in the experiment. Here. Obviously, there, there can't be any pure um, national equilibrium because it's pure conflict game. So the only thing we have is a mixed network equilibrium, which is just mixing some probabilities. We have a five to two of us. Nothing to complicate it here. So now if we go into the Pitot game, then uh, we just add a little bit of payoff perturbation, for example, on these two. In the end, we could also add payoff perturbations to all of these. Or just some of these doesn't matter, right? This is the easiest way to do it. So we have one perturbation for player one and one perturbation for player two. So the thing is, this one is private information for player I. I mean, I like to think of something like okay, which color do I like better? Have I slept well? Am I more aggressive or less aggressive? But just these tiny things. 
right? This is something I know the minute I'm deciding it, but the other person has no idea. Um, but we know that it's distributed in some smallish range, right? So we've normalized that to C so that the range of them is C. Um, and I'm saying smallish because we, we're not keeping that very small at the start. But that's for later. All right. Now we know for this game, we know that exists the Bayesian Nash equilibrium in which the players use the following few strategies. And these are, right, it's the Bayesian Nash equilibrium. They depend on the signals they get. So they, they learn, oh, today, I my theta one is like two. And then I make a choice. So what they have, their strategies are threshold strategies that I'm choosing H if this theta is over some threshold. I mean, we can calculate the threshold and we obviously did, but that's not the most important part here, right? You see, they are always getting slightly more when this theta is here, if they are playing H and nothing more to see. So they are choosing H if this theta is high enough. And if theta is low, they're choosing T. Right? Because if they would always choose T, then the other person would always win, because they would always play H the other way. Initially. Same thing for the second player. Same idea gets more if she's choosing H here and the other one is choosing T. All right. <clears throat> then in each of these equilibria, the player one plays H with a certain probability, which is just C minus two C star one, but right? this is just the threshold because we said everything is distributed uniformly and player two with pretty much the same yeah. So, and it holds that if the C, again, that's the, the size of the deviation here, here if that, um, is right, in the limit, this is just exactly the um, mixed national group, right? These are just the probabilities that player one, player H in the unperturbed game before, and this is the probability that player two played H in the unperturbed game four. So you can show that C1 star and C2 star are functions of C and these probabilities are always positive? Yeah. Okay. I mean, we put that as well, but it's just in Hazani. So, yes. <clears throat> I mean, under some some conditions, obviously, but they are there very much. Okay, thanks. So I, I understand the part that uh, the requirements of Max uh, uh, mixed equilibrium is uh, basically quite open and short of the feedback. Uh, uh, and but uh, still, it's just a mathematical uh, model, yeah. which uh, you know, a simplification of uh, like. But why this matter because, uh, matters uh, uh, whether we end up in a mixed equilibrium because of that is a kind of uncertainty or because just there is a mathematical simplification? Okay, so that's a very, very good point. So um, let me start talking. Yes, so um, the, the, the first question is okay, so if we're just looking at the entire thing, right? That's, what it is, right? It's just a mathematical model we shouldn't care about, right? I mean, this is, I mean, this is just then another mathematical extension, doesn't matter, really, right? Um, however, as soon as we are trying to um, use that as model of human behavior, right, then first of all, we should care if people are actually behaving like that. And second, if um, Right. If the underlying of if our underlying understanding what's behind this model, right, because it has an interpretation, kind of aligns with what we write, what the model should depict in the real world. So um, in in this example, it's 
I mean, one of the motivations is that in the model, I think I have it. No, not on this one. One of the motivations for, for me at least is that if we're going to the left and we don't see mixed measure everywhere at all, right? As a result, even if we beat it place and things like this. this. This doesn't happen except in very weird circumstances where we where it might be a coincidence. However, if we are looking right in, in reality, we, we see things which is very close to mixed magic freeway behavior, right? I mean, even in humans, but more so in everything like biology and all these kind of things. So, and here it might just be that, okay, we are never doing that enough to get some kind of human behavior, right? Or it might just be that we are, um, that, that, that we are just abstracting something away that is actually required for people to actually play national theory. Um, <laughs> I hope that at least answers part of the question. Otherwise, please interrupt me right away. <clears throat> so, again, so when this noise vanishes, the mixing probability implied by the pure static equilibrium of the preserved game converge to the mixing probabilities of the mixed vector equilibrium of the unpreserved game. All right. So, what we do is okay, we are taking Hadani's purification idea literally, right? Said it's an idea, right? Interpretation of Mixed, um, how we can understand mixed Nash equilibrium. We are taking it very, very literally, right? We are throwing on this additional noise, right? We are not even trying to make it uh, a taste parameter or anything, right? We're giving them, you're getting this amount of money plus some epsilon, which is also an amount of money, right? Because that's what we do in the labs. And see if that helps people play closer to the natural human prediction. All right. So that allows us to answer several questions. And one of them is do they reach with pure strategy cutoff strategies? Sorry, pure strategy cutoffs in the perturbed game, right? Which is the main idea. The yeah, underlying assumptions for these are really, really my special competitive measures, right? They just need to be some kind of right. I mean, there, there, there's really no way to choose less pay off than, I mean, the, the less pay off option than the more pay off option. Then, how do different levels of private pay off perturbation impact mixing problems and outcome frequencies? Right? Because in theory, the um, the equilibrium we're getting in the end, I mean, in the one case, the, the Bayesian, in the other one, the um, mixed net equilibrium, for all these games we're looking at, they are very close to the same. Right? I mean, they are just tiny differences in the prediction. And then, does it influence different people in a different way? Right? Are some people better using it? Right? I mean, there are some, right? this is a very, very open ended question, and right, it's more for future research or that we can get an idea of what's going on. Maybe some people are better at mixing from the start. Maybe some people are better at learning from right? introducing these small, small perturbations. We don't know. This is just very open ended. So these one are the really robust ones we want to check. All right. So let me check. Fine. All right. <clears throat> so as I said before, this is the game of players who play. Um, I'll show you a screen in two slides. Three. Um, the AKA experiment consists of four parts, and each of them consists of 15 rounds. Obviously, we, we um, need 15 rounds because they are learning in between, and we are talking about the equilibrium concept. Um, all right. The four parts. The first one is the warm up. 
they are playing the game in the natural sequential mode. That means they are basically getting the game. And they are told, oh yeah, now this one, you will see how it looks on the screen in a second. This one is now three. What do you do? And then they are getting the same screen again. And now this is seven. What do you do? 50 times. All right. Okay, you see seven, three, and so on were bad examples. These are the numbers with actually show, right? You can see it quite a lot difference between minus, minus 100 and plus 100. So this is between 200 and 400. But when it is selected, subjects privately form, and then each subject makes a choice. They're getting informed of that and so on. So do, do they know that uh, this is uh, randomly selected? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they, they know. They, I mean, they know exactly and what, I mean, because we know what common problems is. They know it's random, right? That, that, that this is randomly selected, that the other players is randomly selected, and that they are completely independent, right? Because this is something that's very hard to grasp for a lot of subjects and labs that if a minus 100 shows, is, is chosen for me, doesn't say anything about what is chosen for the other person. Some people think there's a positive correlation. Some people think there's a negative one. We really drill them into that because that's very important for the entire thing. Because that's one of the assumptions I just dropped. <laughs> if it's not independent, it's not good. Okay, so but these numbers are really kind of significant yes. that you're showing. So it's yes, it's actually changing also the, the game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean my yes. understanding from your introduction was that it's more like just a signal. Exactly. So it's more of a coordination, but exactly. So um later on we will see we will we'll do smaller ones. Mm -hmm. Um, this is just the warm up phase, and if we are uh, not changing a lot, they, they don't even realize that we're changing the number. But yes, here it's very significant. And it's mostly to train them, right? That the warm up phase, this is how it works there. Um, <clears throat> in the end, it doesn't change the, the equilibrium predict prediction by much. So, they should, I mean, there is no theoretical reason why should, they should play very different mixtures here than compared to the other one, but yeah. Okay. All right, so then um, what we did in part two and part three and part four is we're using the strategy method, which, which we are basically telling them, right, again here, significant, still the, the same changes, but now we're telling them, okay, we're playing this game again, over and over again, but now you're making a decision just in case this one comes up, right? And then we're giving them all the options. We're giving them just this one here, and we're asking them to decide, right? Basically what's their strategy. Um, obviously, we're not following the strategy because it confuses them, but this is just basically asking for the privilege. All right. So it looks like, sorry, it looks like this. Right? So this is the example of the first round, but the other ones look very similar. See here, this is the entire screen, and it was explained to them in excruciating detail. Here you see what they are seeing. You see a slightly different game here, right? Two, two, three, something random. And here the randomization goes on. But we see blue is always the one that, that I am. And this is an example for the first round of the first part, right? Where something was actually wrong. This was running here back and forth, and then stopped at some point to make sure that they know, okay, this is now randomly drawn. I mean, obviously it was randomly drawn before that, but yeah, that's how it works. We make very clear that they don't know which one was drawn for the other one, but it is in this range, right? 
So this is what was happening in the first part and the second. Oh, sorry, I removed that. So why? In the second part, where they are choosing the strategy, these arrows are just not there anymore. They disappear. And you're asked, okay, now you see how it works. We do the same thing, but now you choose for every one of these options. So and they choose either A or B for each one of them. Right? So we have 11 decisions for each one of them whenever they choose. Rest still then. In the wall up, you make a decision and you know the tree of consequences that if this is the game, then you would earn that amount of money. Yes, exactly. I mean, here also, but in, in, in the, yeah, I mean, it, it looks exactly the same, right? They know if I'm right, if the other person is choosing B and I'm choosing, or let's say A and I'm choosing also A, I'm getting one. The only thing I don't know is what the other guy is getting when it's just. Yes, uh, I don't know about this point that uh, uh, people have to make a uh, decision about every uh, type of payoffs, or uh, this game is just repeated and uh, see the outcome and again and again and again. again. So the, the game, because it would be the second game, then I would uh, uh, expect that people are actually randomizing, realizing that, oh, I got nothing, and I changed uh, my strategy to another one. So, exactly. So, the, the, the first round would be, I mean, the, the warm up phase would be what you describe second, right? Mm -hmm. So they're getting the same thing over and over again. We are obviously not you, I mean, I think we looked at the data, but I don't remember it anymore because we had no prediction. But this this was just to explain to them how it works because of exactly what you say, right? So they mm -hmm. they might randomize because they are updating all this at the same time, right? They might be learning something about the other player or they might think they, they are learning something something that might be going on, we couldn't see. This is why we are focusing on the data generated in the last three parts. Here we see, right, all these decisions at the same time, at the same, right, the same information. Even if they are, right, if they're changing that strategy over time, at this point in time, they always have the same information and they should, yeah, make a few choices. And there is, no rational, I mean, rational is very difficult to say in, in economic <laughs> thoughts, but even very mild interpretations of, of rationality would all support playing out of strategies. Um, <clears throat> for most people, this is clear, so I would keep that very, very, very close. Let's say you're playing something like this, and then cut off, and you have one down here and one up here. If you're changing these two and just flipping their, their order, right, might happen at any point, it looks the same to the other person because the other person has no idea what has been chosen at random numbers, right? So they have exactly the same probability of being chosen. That's all ID, everything like that, and they know that because we drilled that into them. The only difference is in expectations, I'm getting more utility. And given that, I mean, as we said before, the pair of differences are not that tiny here. These are 80 euro cents, which is not a lot, but for a single click difference, it's not too bad. <clears throat> but <laughs> all right, so quickly back. We are having this one. Then we move to a slightly smaller pair of differences here. Um, and you can see that they are not super, super tiny. This was our initial idea that we are making things smaller and smaller towards the area, towards the very end. But we stopped beforehand because we have seen that some other problem that we saw, which we will see in a second. So from there, we then skip on right to the underdog game, which is just they're playing the same thing. And they are just all the same number of people. Looks weird, but this is just playing the net equilibrium plus giving them a randomization device because we know people can't randomize. So if someone wants to play, okay, maybe not 50 50, that's a direct example because they are 11. But if someone wants to play, okay, I, I can't do that in my head, but <laughs> 3 over 11, right, as a probability for A, 
then you should just choose three of them, whichever one doesn't matter because all is likely in the answer case. So you, you are just showing the same number for you? Yes, same number, 11 lines. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're explaining to them each one of these games is randomly chosen. We didn't do first games, we had other names for that, but but and that's how it is. So, so we couldn't, so, so the subjects cannot even play two if that's three because they can really Exactly, they can. <clears throat> Um, so, which which would be a problem if we wanted to to test the exact equilibrium predictions? Obviously, um, technically not because there is one which is closer to it. But given that I don't believe that we can actually pay them utilities, um, and I've shown in another paper that risk aversion matters a lot, even in these small stakes. I know it's not rational, and people, I mean. Theory people will fight on that right away, but that's another project. So, <laughs> but yeah, this is not something, but it's technically. <clears throat> and uh, they do compete with other subjects. Yes. Uh -huh. This yeah. is, I mean, they're direct, directly interacting with set of. Uh, I didn't in matching group of six. So they are randomly matched with five other people. Oh no, okay. it's a little bit more complicated than we have written here with six other people because they have in terms of players, right? Mm -hmm. And then they are matching together. Anyway. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the reason for this is because we want to actually test if we can behave, right? We, we, we are not interested that much in right one shot or initial play behavior here. We really want to see equilibrium behavior because talking about Nash equilibrium, saying Nash equilibrium is a bad prediction for initial play is kind of useless, right? So, equilibrium. Thank you. so right. playing that over and over again. Six, because there's no good way to be able to, I mean, that they would believe that I'm playing the same person over and over again. Um, but it's very unlikely that you're meeting. The same person over and over again. Yeah. All right. Given that I said before, right, we want to also check with a few other things, right? Who can do it better and all these things? We have added like fairly small battery of standard tests. Nothing really. Yeah. Um, so cognitive reflection tests. This one is the only thing that's a little bit out of um, out of the ordinary. We have tested how they are playing against the computer, where we tell them this computer is randomizing like 50 50 or something like that, right? This is basically just an adjusted test. Can they roughly estimate expected values? Right? It's nothing more than that. Are they are they able to do that? Um, the same game? Or not? It looks very similar, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, I mean, it's pretty much the same. Yeah. Without 50 50 is not, thing. It's not an equilibrium. No, 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 no. But we gave them different values for the computer and asked them what to choose. Mm -hmm. So, and right, if it's 50 50, that should play H for sure. And if it's like just one over 10, um, that the other one was playing T, then they should play T if they are. So, right, we have like six values where we're testing. Think that and also with slightly changed payment parameters but in in, in essence it's, if people can do it they can do it both for probabilities and values that's not and okay risk attitudes and some very generic things all right so let me just briefly i'm done already oh yeah i'm already kind of slow but perfectly fine because now I'm finally showing you some of the results that we have. Um, let me first give you an idea of how these things look. Right. So this is one subject, subject five in round 14, with the this is the second, right? Second part. I mean, this doesn't really matter. I just wanted to show you how it looks like. Right. Okay, this person chose this round, 
a perfect cutoff density, right? For the low payoff, she has chosen T. I mean, if it was labeled T like that. And for the high payoffs, she has chosen H. This is not the equilibrium prediction, but it's a clear cutoff prediction, which is already pretty good. Then we have another person, subject H. I mean, round 14 as well, because I've just chosen people from round 14. Here, you see that that's a cutoff, but it's inverse. This person has, has no fucking clue what he's doing. I mean, Yes, this, this person learned also mistakes, and a couple of rounds later, he realized, oh, fuck, I'm making it all wrong, and he, he fixed it. But already contaminated like half of them. <laughs> no, it's right. I mean, he has not, he has not a super point. I mean, all right, this person is, <clears throat> I mean, I haven't checked into who that actually is, but I like to pretend. That he is a bachelor economist student who has his first game theory class and realized, oh, I should mix here. That's a matching case, I should mix. How do I mix here? I do this. <laughs> Obviously, not very clever because, I mean, you could get the same mixing probabilities. So, the only thing that matters by going here and here. And what would you get? Okay, you would just get. 90 payoff more from this game, right? Expectations, but you know what I'm trying to say. So, happens rather difficult to find someone with exactly that pattern, but I managed to do it. <laughs> but we have some randomization there. Then we have someone like this. This is a perfectly rational choice, right? This is clearly not the net equilibrium, right? Um, but this is rational, given right, what he believes that the other person will do. So in this case, if he believes the other person is mixing, or the other people are all mixing 50-50, or the population is mixing 50-50, they should all take this. Probably also what I would do. <clears throat> so, um, given that I only have 50 minutes, I'll go over this very quickly. The main problem is that, right, we have people like this. This is actually the net equilibrium. Someone played it like the first one, right? Perfect cutoff. It's very clear what, what that means, right? This is what they're trying to tell you. Um, however, what do we do with data if someone does something like this? Do we throw it out? I mean, it's not really 100% clear, right, what we should do. I mean, to me, it looks very obvious that this person misclicked. They are making a lot of choices. I mean, like 45 or so, just for these types of choices. That you're misclicking once, I mean, it happened to me while testing it all the time. So it's not very strange. So, um, not gonna go into too much detail here because it's statistics, and I've talked about that before like three weeks ago. Um, what we did is we developed a test which basically the underlying assumption is that people are making mistakes, which is what we see in experiments, and we're getting some mistake probability, which I call epsilon here. and. Yeah, this, this goes to too much detail here. And then we can calculate for every one of our subjects that we have in our pool, how close are they to actually playing the pool based on capital strategies. Right, you can see if someone is never making a mistake and playing pure cutoff, there's no mistake, right? That's the best estimate where they had on here. I forgot about that again. There should be no evidence here. Ignore that. But you can see like 40 of our people have made no mistake with a large perturbation. So that's R2 that I've said before. And this is not just only for one decision, but for all the 
I forgot for all the 12 rounds we encountered. Um, then there are people who, these are, this is exactly one mistake, right? In all the rounds, they just made one mistake and then fixed it later on. So one mistake in one round, zero mistakes in 11, and so on, and, and it goes up there. So you can see there are like not even half who play according to what Azani would have predicted, but there is a whole group where we can reject that they are playing random, right? This is that everything that doesn't cut this 0.5 bar here. So everyone who is around here, we, we can't reject that they are just clicking stuff at random, which is what I'm expecting what to see. They either have no clue what they are doing or they don't understand the task. And for them here, there's something in between, right? And you can see all these lines here. These are just, right? If we are saying that epsilon is, like we allow them to make a mistake of 20%, then everything under here is good than that. Excuse me? Yes. So, but strictly speaking, not all of of strategies are equilibrium, right? Because the oh, this, larger than yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, yes. So this is not even, I mean, and given that I don't have very much time, I'm not gonna even touch the equilibrium part because it doesn't make very much sense to, to think that these here are playing equilibrium because all the requirements for equilibrium are not fulfilled, right? They, they are not even individual maximizing. So okay. all the equilibrium we need, everything we need for Nash equilibrium are just not working. But yes, I mean, only like, a couple of them are working, even if you introduce receiver. We had that in the paper, and I wish I was faster than I could tell you more about this. I think it's interesting. But yeah, we have a range of them which are so. How many of them played like 50 50? Yeah. Like 50 um... 50, surprisingly, not very, very, not, mm -hmm. not that more common than the other ones. Interesting question. Mm -hmm. very 11 questions. Um, <laughs> that's. Okay. Uh, I mean, I would also get 50 50 something. I mean, obviously, 50 50 means. Yeah. If it's higher than the average, then I play this. If it's lower, then I play that. Ah, OK. No, no. But no, the problem with 50 50 is 11 choices. So we, we mm -hmm. thought about that problem before, and I thought we're not making an even number of choices there. So they can't play 50 50. They OK, then play think very close to 50. If you, but if, if, if you ignore the middle one, then. Um, but well, well, ah, yeah, I could also do that. No, but if you're just taking the both in the middle as, as 50 50, even that is not much higher than the ones around that. Mm -hmm. The few which are a little more chosen are obviously the, the ones right where, where they're playing entirely just down or entirely up, but it's more, it's actually. So you also counted those here. In they the, also counted. I mean, in the four they are slightly more often, but they are also not the majority. I mean, I think in this they are like. I think in here there might be fifteen, but in the later one they are not. There are like ten people. Yes. When you uh, calculated the so-called optimal kind of strategy, uh, you compared that to analysis to that, I guess. But how do you know that? Uh, uh, that uh, the respondents know the optimal mm. You know, that's that what I said. I mean, okay, I, I should have changed my introduction entirely. Um, this drive, this has nothing to do with the, I mean, in the paper, we were talking about the, the, the optimal re response, right? Because it depends on what I think the other person do. But here, it's just, they're either playing a cutoff or not. Doesn't matter if it's the optimal or not, right? Because every cutoff can be rationalized by some belief about what the other. Yeah, I understand this part, but let's say that uh, the cutoff is at uh, the second side, mm -hmm. then the error, uh, the estimated error term uh, is uh, is uh, different. If uh, I think that the optimal uh, cutoff is at the second side. Okay, so and, uh, you have to have a benchmark uh, model to compare uh, the 
there or uh, okay, yeah, no, do you know that what is the correct? Uh, no, no, the, the correct one is every cut. Every cut off, right? Doesn't matter what it is, if it's at two, at eight, at five, everyone is counted as correct. Doesn't matter, even if they are changing it over time, right? These are multiple periods combined. If they are, they are changing it over time, also fine. They might be learning something. The question uh, in which order do you show them these random numbers? So you just generate uh, 11 uh, completely random? No, they're not going to be random, otherwise, we would have been, would have been difficult. Um, always like this. Right? So when, right, I mean, when they're making the choice, they're choosing here, right? They're seeing all of them, all possible ones. And if they are seeing what the outcome of the game is, I mean, yeah. That, but that but uh, I, my question is, you don't just go from left to right. No. Uh, you 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 show them each of uh, yeah. 11, one in a random order. No, I mean, in this one, we are forcing them to choose all of them at the same time. They are shown always like this, right, from left to right. So <laughs> all of them at the same time. All of them at the same time here. In the first period, it was completely random. Uh -huh. right? But in this one, where we are asking for the packages, they are, they they have to choose right for each one at the same time. I mean, of course, they can choose here first. Yeah, and I, then see. There, I see. I see. But okay. it, it's all on the same tree. Okay, so there cannot be actually a learning. No, here. no. I mean, this is why we <laughs> didn't want to use the. The direct method, how we call it, right? The first one, because there might be some learning mm -hmm. or perceived <laughs> learning that's enough. Right? They, they might think, oh, yeah, I had a 304 will not pass. Thank you. Very good. Sorry. Oh, no, no. it's perfect. <clears throat> so, again, we don't want to go into too much detail here. Um, with smaller perturbations, okay, the picture looks a little bit different because the scale is differently, but the, the idea is fairly similar, right? And this is very robust to a lot of checks we have done. Um, smaller perturbations. It gets a little bit more noisy down here. So they're making slightly more mistakes down here. But up here, it's roughly the same. And yes, this is an outlier. This guy is clearly doing something. I mean, he's doing it. But now Very you have less over 50 percent no? in the previous yeah. year you had more it's um i mean it, it looks a little bit weird it is significantly less over right i mean this is what we can test but we, we cannot really significant i mean we cannot make a really robust conclusion about that there will be more right mm -hmm. this is we can't reject for roughly the same number we cannot say anything now or the So we have a couple of people who are just randomizing some which are in the middle, but more than, than half are making decisions roughly in the right direction. And from here, and finally, um, okay, now this is the one I thought I added. So right, this is part two, and as a control, we have the part four, which is right just the game, right? Unperturbed and looked a little bit weird. And this is really just the control plot, right? Because there is no rational prediction. It doesn't matter how they choose these things because they mean all the same. And there we see, I mean, some people stick to these, like a couple of them, but it's all of the best. So we can actually see that this is not because they, right? I mean, because this is some problem of the tests or because the design forces them to go into that, that direction. But if we're not giving these, them these perturbations, they're not playing cut off zone, which is perfectly rational, right? Because if they don't have perturbations, they don't need to, but just a robust check for us. So let me just quickly go over that. Just very quickly, uh, sorry that I don't have more time to, to go over that. They're getting much, much closer to the net prediction when we are introducing these pair of perturbations. 
Um, surprisingly close. I'm still a little bit skeptical how close we are. I mean, this might be a coincidence. I mean, again, we are still writing down the paper, so um, I don't want to put too much emphasis on that. Right? It's not the oh, we're saving national bloom with that right away. Um, but if we're playing the same game, I mean, we have that in another another sample. If we are letting them play this game, they are very far off from this. That's why we chose that game. Here in our ones, right, this is very, very close. This is not super close, but it's very close compared to what we usually observe. Usually they are playing something like around 60 years as well. Right? If you're doing a game view, that's on the other side. I can see that problem. Same thing here, it's so much close. And even carries over, right? If they have played this one before, if we don't have good patients anymore. Right. So, uh, very quickly. Okay, send me the other put up actually here. I don't know why. I haven't thought much about that. All right. So, um, let me just quickly summarize. Okay, this is the first experimental test of Hazan's purification idea. I mean, this is a proposal, obviously, right? I mean, there are just many, many other ways how you could do that, right? Actually, shrink the payoff perturbations to a very, very small amount might be interesting. Not sure. But even with the initial prediction of Azani that they should play cutoff strategies, we have huge heterogeneity there in the subjects, right? One are perfect on point, which is surprising because it's like 50 decisions. Some are just entirely off. There's some positive relationship between their mathematical skills and how that well they are able to randomize here, um, <clears throat> which is actually nicely in line with um, people, right, with what we said before. If they experience in Spanish equilibrium, or in this case, if they experience in effective values calculations, because a lot of mathematical skills in universities are respected value calculations, or at least they have seen it, they are playing better. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for all the questions. <laughs> Can you go back one slide or two? One more. Three. So, so, so here, your claim was that if part four was played before part two and three, then you would see not so nice numbers. So, uh, you see that? Yes. Uh, and but, but you have that before in the other uh, We We have, I mean, we have this as an. Okay, my point is, I mean, that we run that like two years ago, and I don't remember exactly. Oh, yeah, I know. Now I remember. We have actually run the entire thing exactly like this with C0 just in all parts, right? And then we wanted to compare this part four with the one that we see here. Um, from just a rough look, it looks very different, but I haven't run any any other from this. But yeah, that's very different. The reason why we're not just moving it up here, because they might just might just be experienced, right? Um, generally, if you're worried about experience, we are dropping the first three or five rounds in, in every one of these because we we pre-registered to do so, but after like two or three rounds, there's not much change, right? I mean, change in the, the type of behavior. Individual people still adjust a little bit. But the behavior looks very stable, and also the mixing probabilities are super, super stable after a round of the three. So that's not much of a problem. We might need So you mentioned the possibility of also conducting something in between three and four, where you would have a tiny, uh, yeah. like one euro cent or something. Yeah. Uh, but I guess you would ex expect something really close to three, no, or four. So okay, yeah. 
So the, the main reason why, I mean, at first we wanted to do that. The main reason why we didn't do it is because we didn't, ex I mean, when we started the entire project, we didn't expect people, so many people that were not playing with cut -off strategies. This was something we, I mean, was a little bit surprising because it seems very natural work to us. I mean, um, yes, we expect it to be, I mean, if we're playing that still in that order, right there, they are both very, very different in, in this and also in the, yeah, and the cutoff behavior should be roughly like this. A little bit more messy because we have seen already the adherence to cutoff goes down here, right? Not by, by a lot, but by a little bit, so they're making more mistakes. And that's something that we have observed, I mean, that everyone that's very often. If we're giving them less, less incentive to be careful, they're less careful. Right. And if we're giving them one euro cent incentive to click properly, uh, then they don't care. So, I mean, that's my prediction. So, thank you very much for this call. Uh, thank you. Very much. Any further questions? Then, uh, yes, I'm around. Yeah. I'll send emails afterwards if it will be now. So, thanks a lot again. Oh, the wrong version to the video. So that's they they play as um, they should for in the theory. Can you somehow connect these two results? Can you compare? <laughs>